Donate blood, save a life. It's been part of our national consciousness since World War II. The Army and Navy have called upon the Red Cross for an increased quota of 4 million pints of blood in 1943. And Americans heeded the call for blood. Between 1941 and 1945, the Red Cross collected 13 million pints headed for wounded soldiers on the field. Transfused blood was miraculous, saving countless numbers of soldiers' lives. Today's scientific use of blood has emerged as one of the major medical advances of World War II. Of those wounded in These days, more than 14 million units of whole blood or red blood cells are transfused every year in the United States. The benefits of blood, so it goes, are so obvious as to be beyond question. But are they? Now, a growing number of experts are questioning the value of blood and blood products and are concluding that for many patients, the risks of transfusions can outweigh the benefits. It's a controversial point of view that is changing medical practice and potentially saving lives. And you might be surprised to learn that one of the driving forces behind it has been the Jehovah's Witnesses. I want to know when I go in there that they will not use the blood under any circumstances, whether I live or die. Jehovah's Witnesses, like Betty Myers, see blood as a precious fluid, so precious that being transfused with someone else's blood means losing the chance for eternal life. There are several passages in the book of Genesis, the book of Leviticus, and the book of Acts that prohibits the taking of blood because blood is in your body as a life to you. In 1994, a committee of Jehovah's Witnesses from the World Headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, made a simple request to hospitals in the area. Give us the best medical and surgical care you can. Just do it without the use of blood transfusions. Many facilities turn them down, but Englewood Hospital in nearby New Jersey agreed. To be honest with you, we just accepted this as a challenge. We, we thought that someone had to take care of the, this population, and we were so ready to learn. So you didn't think they were out of line or suicidal or on the road for trouble pushing we, this? We may have, uh, going back uh, that far, but uh, we certainly learned very, very quickly that um, that's not the case. As chief of anesthesiology and critical care at Englewood, Dr. Arie Shander was already questioning conventional wisdom about blood transfusions. Transfusion of blood components seemed to be erratic, and I started looking in my own practice to see that the decisions were not really based on anything, and that when I did apply some rationale to the decision, the amount of transfusions that I was using clearly was much, much smaller than what was being used around me. Within a year of treating Jehovah's Witness patients without transfusions, Shander and Englewood noticed something unexpected. Our physicians started seeing witness patients coming, getting their surgery, getting their medical care without a single drop of blood, going home either at the same time as other patients or even going home earlier, no complications. And that's when we started to recognize that there is something here that we need to investigate more. Dr. Shander wasn't the only physician questioning the value of blood. At about the same time, critical care specialist Dr. Paul Merrick was also coming to some surprising conclusions about blood transfusions. In 1993, he published this study suggesting that transfusions weren't doing the very job they were supposed to do, and that is carry oxygen to cells in the body. One reason, he speculated, was that some donated blood might be sitting too long on the shelf. What we found was that the older the blood, the less effective it was in, uh, in unloading oxygen in the tissues. Donated blood must be used within 42 days. But just like anything else that sits on a shelf, blood degrades. And as it ages, red blood cells become misshapen making it harder for them to maneuver through tiny capillaries. Since then, there have been uh, a whole host of studies which have actually supported our finding that the older the blood, the, more the, the greater the number of complications and the less effective the blood is in delivering oxygen.
One example, a 2008 Cleveland Clinic study that looked at the records of 6,000 heart surgery patients. It showed that those who received blood more than two weeks old had a significantly higher risk of complications like infection, respiratory problems, kidney failure, and even death. There is disagreement in the medical community about whether older blood causes problems. But it's not just the age of blood that might be harming patients. Dozens of studies suggest that transfusions are linked to other serious risks, including cancer recurrence, organ failure, and the significant long-term impact blood may be having on the recipient's immune system. We know now that transfusion of blood lowers the host's immune response and ability to fight infection, so it predisposes um, sick people to get infections. Dr. Merrick is a harsh critic of the status quo when it comes to blood use in American hospitals. He says doctors use blood transfusions the way they do because, well, that's how they've always done it. Dr. Shander agrees. Are there large numbers of Americans who are getting blood probably inappropriately or blood products? Yes, I think that the short answer is yes. The question of appropriateness is something which is um, uh, very ill-defined. Are they at risk? The recipients? Yes. Absolutely. If you can't demonstrate benefit, all you're offering the patient is risk. Need to Know went to the American Red Cross, which supplies 40% of the nation's blood, to find out what its attitude is towards this new thinking on transfusions. Dr. Richard Benjamin, chief medical officer of the Red Cross, supports the conservative use of blood, but is wary of much of the research about the potential hazards of donated blood, including older blood. There are a number of studies published. There are retrospective analyses. Uh, they are generally inconclusive. We really do need randomized controlled trials to answer this question. Large clinical trials, including one sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, are underway now to determine what effect, if any, the age of blood has on patient outcomes. The results of that research could have a major effect on how the Red Cross conducts business. If indeed it turns out that six-week-old blood is not as good as three-week-old blood, we would have to change our whole collection system to supply the appropriate blood for hospital needs. How would and, that affect you? Well, we'll go out and do it. I mean, we will do what is best for patients and is best for hospitals. Dr. Harvey Klein is the head of the Department of Transfusion Medicine at the National Institutes of Health's Clinical Center. He supports many of the ways transfusion practices are changing, but he points out that this shouldn't lead anyone to believe that blood transfusions are always bad. In some situations, there is simply no substitute. If you're uh, dying on the battlefield, there's no replacement for human blood. If you've been shot in an alley, there's no replacement for human blood. And in fact, if you begin to bleed like crazy in the operating room, only blood will save you. And indeed, Englewood Hospital does transfuse blood when needed. But since 1995, the hospital has applied its blood-conserving standard of care to all patients, cutting transfusions by 40%. How do they do it? They use an aggressive approach involving what they call patient blood management and bloodless surgery. Here's how it works. First, candidates for surgery are carefully evaluated and treated for problems like anemia. The point is to keep them from needing transfusions in the first place. And what happens once they get to the operating room? This patient is having a heart valve replaced. We actually take some of your blood out and keep it by your bedside so there's no storage at room temperature so it's active and it's whole blood and load your vessels with liquid so that if you're going to bleed it's going to be very very dilute and then at the end of surgery you return this blood. Even the blood lost when surgeons open the patient's chest is collected, cleansed of contaminants and returned. These so-called bloodless surgical techniques meticulously preserve the patient's own blood so she won't need someone else's. Dr. Shander says compared to patients who get transfusions, patients without them do better. If you look at the cardiac population, for example, compared to other institution, uh, a risk-adjusted mortality is the lowest in the state of New Jersey with 
probably the lowest transfusion rates in the world. What are the circumstances where you really absolutely have to transfuse someone? There's just no question about it. You know, for me, it's a very difficult question to ask because there are patients that we have here who have hemoglobin um, levels of less than two grams per deciliter, which is considered to be incompatible with survival, who have gone home. So Without a transfusion. Without a transfusion. We generally, if somebody will accept blood, we would transfuse them when they get to those, those levels. We won't let them get down to those levels. But we've seen people survive with aggressive therapy without receiving blood. The notion that less may be more when it comes to blood is catching on, but slowly. About 100 hospitals across the country offer blood management programs, up from about 25 in the mid-1990s. One is Eastern Maine Medical Center in Bangor, Maine. Dr. Erwin Gross established their program in 2007, and within three years, he cut transfusions by 60 percent, saving the hospital almost $1.5 million a year. Much of this is not high tech. There really are very few aspects of patient blood management that are not accessible to even the smallest of community hospitals. Much of this is just good clinical care of the patient. This bag saved the driver. This bag saved the passenger. There is no doubt that when necessary, donated blood saves lives. The question the medical community is trying to answer now is when is it necessary? Joining us in studio now to answer just a few more questions is Need to Know's medical correspondent, Dr. Emily Sine. So, Emily, I'm a patient, I'm going in the hospital. What kind of questions should I be asking about transfusions? Well, you know, you should ask questions. Everybody should ask questions. If it's the case of surgery, the first question you want to ask is, is this a procedure that requires a blood transfusion? And depending on the answer you get, you want to ask your doctor, is there anything I can do to reduce my own risk for needing a transfusion? And these are the blood management techniques talked about in the piece. And these are very simple things. How, how do I get myself in the best shape possible? How do I uh, reduce anemia and problems like that? So when I get to the OR, mm -hmm. I don't need a transfusion. Then you should ask, well, how do you compare to other doctors doing this procedure? Do you use more blood or less blood? Does this institution use more blood or less blood than neighbors or, or large academic medical centers? Whatever your wishes are in terms of blood transfusions, whether they're religiously based or not, you want to make sure that the doctors you're talking to know what they are. Let's talk about the other side of the coin, donation. Does this mean that people should heal back on donations? No, absolutely not. No expert we spoke with would suggest that at all. This is a, a discussion about how to use a scarce resource. The scarce resource is blood. We need donors. We're going to need donors now. We're going to need donors into the future. This is really a discussion about how do we use uh, what they're giving us through donations in the best way possible. So it's good for the patients and, and we make sure we're doing it correctly. And especially for talking about the age of the blood as being a factor and its effectiveness. I know the NH NIH just instead we saw that in the piece. What other investigations are ongoing? You know, it's so interesting, Allison. This is the only developed country that, until just recently, did not have a national adverse event uh, blood transfusion mm -hmm. monitoring program. So just this past February, the Centers for Disease Control has launched just such a program to give us a snapshot of what we're seeing nationally. You know, we do know about certain things, like mortality related to some types of blood transfusions or blood products, but we don't know much else. So this will allow hospitals to upload their data to the CDC and allow them to analyze and compare to other programs. First time we're going to know something about what's going on in this country. It's called the National Hemovigilance Program. It's just launched recently in February. This also begs a question about science. What about artificial blood? Sure. Every, this is, this is the, the science fiction part, the, the thing that's always sort of on the horizon. When are we going to get that chemical that we can use that will replace the need for blood transfusions, blood donation? You know, that's a, that's a horizon that's always moving into the future, unfortunately. Some things came up recently. They were used in clinical trials. They were not successful. 
Uh, they're looking at other things, actually taking the, some of the molecules inside red blood cells, isolating those. I think one of the, the sort of coolest science fiction things out there is this blood farming where they're looking at stem cells and trying to actually grow red blood cells in a factory and then using that. But nothing is on the horizon or, or close to the marketplace anytime soon. Um, so for now, donating blood, it's going to be the thing that we need to do to help people who are, who are in the hospital, trauma victims, and absolutely uh, in the military. But blood farms, that's great sci-fi. Blood farming, very sci-fi. <laughs> Dr. Emily Sine, thanks a lot. Thanks, Allison.